Um, I'm pleased to introduce Yi Chow. Uh, Yi earned his PhD from Princeton, uh, 93, and then moved to JPL and has been there si almost ever since. Uh, last year he moved from JPL uh, to take over actually his own company, uh, Remote Sensing Solutions. And uh, Yi's been involved in a whole range of things uh, at JPL. Once again, a lot of them that uh, talk to this workshop. Uh, he's been involved in development of ROMs. Uh, he was the lead of the Aquarius satellite, and he's been very heavily involved with SWAT, which is sort of the next generation altimeter. Um, we've given him the near impossible task of telling us all about remote sensing resources in 20 minutes, uh, so I won't take up any more of his time, and so thanks, Yi. Thanks, Andy. Thank you very much. Um, I want to clarify, it's not my company when I decided to uh, leave JPL about a year ago to start my new adventure. I picked the smallest company who can work with JPL from the business perspective. So I joined Remote Sensing Solutions a year from ago. It's three miles east of here, so if you draw a circle, rather than go north three miles, and now I'll go east three miles. Um, I will try my best to uh, summarize um, this particular topic I was assigned to, uh, start with uh, current different satellite programs, and also talk about a few challenges toward the end, and try to uh, raise some questions about how the remote sensing data being integrated with complementary in situ data you heard this morning, and also uh, from uh, the assimilation uh, forecasting model perspective. If I give a talk, uh, when I started GAPL, the task would be really easy because this is the satellite we have. <laughs> Thanks to Dimitri uh, provide this wonderful uh, diagram, uh, the, one of the highest resolution ocean models simulating really complex, this three-dimensional time-evolving uh, fluid. Uh, GAPL oceanography started up as a successful CSAT program launched in 78, even though it have three months of data, but demonstrate the capability to measure wind from space measure sea surface height from space, and also have interferometry radar. So it really opened the door of the satellite oceanography. Um, in the 80s, the first generation of scientists came, and I came about early 90s, and that's about Topex uh, satellite was launched. And that's, I was told, it's an emerging new field of satellite oceanography. And does take a lot of patience working with satellite program because any one of these missions take at least a decade, if not more. And, and then turn out what they told us is true. Um, now when I left JPL, this is all the satellite either being launched or in space. It's more than a dozen satellites dedicated or related to o ocean uh, science. Um, you can pick your favorite satellites here. So what I'm gonna, going to do is to, uh, from the physical parameter point of view, walk you through some of these uh, remote sensing principles. Uh, the missions, the data sets, and then so lead to challenges related to the carbon cycle. It's really started from the first satellite from meteorology in the 60s. Uh, when you launch the satellite, you see the first uh, global map of the atmospheric processes, and you can tell the images quality in the 60s may not be as clear what you see today on the TV and the open your iPhones. Um, in about late 70s and early 80s, we start to send satellite routinely measure ocean temperature and this is uh, one of the typical infrared images of the Gulf Stream. You can sh see a realistic uh, meanders of the Gulf Stream, the warm water coming from uh, uh, the equator and goes through Cape Hatteras and the separate and then go to Europe. Europe. And also you see a lot of these uh, uh, mesoscale eddies and the meanders and the filaments and also the, some of the eddies uh, being spinned off from this uh, mean circulation. And that's kind of the uh, old, old days chart, and then people go out expedition and try to uh, draw a weather chart. So now you start to have a quantitative description from space on a routine basis. Uh, just a little bit of the temperature uh, remote sensing. Uh, typically, the infrared, um, you need to have multi-channel uh, sensing so that you can correct the, uh, the cloud contamination, atmospheric attenuation, and the solar re reflection, and so forth. Uh, typically, um, early days have five channels to correct the different uh, SST-derived uh, 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 temperatures. And then the take-home message is uh, we can measure SST from space, typically on the order of half a degree uh, centigrade. That's the state-of-art um, accuracy you can see 
Um, if you go to the web today, go to the GPL data center, you can see almost a dozen different SST satellites now. I just to give you a few illustration of these infrared sensors. This is from a combined MODIS and Terra, uh, MODIS sensor on both Terra and Aqua, and each of these have two channels. So now you have four different sensors and do a daily composite of uh, sea surface temperature over one single day. Uh, this is the polar orbiting satellite from Europe, the METOP satellites. Uh, managed by UMASAT, the European uh, kind of satellite organization. Uh, similar set, uh, polar orbiting satellite from the US just launched recently as part of the NPP satellite series so called NPOSE and heavily delayed, you'll see on the news and NPRs. Um, the ver various uh, uh, temperature sensor show you similar uh, polar orbiting uh, infrared data sets. One striking of these features, no matter how many satellites you see, both of these, uh, the, the NASA MODIS sensor and then uh, the METOP satellite, you'll see where MODIS cannot see the temperature, also the European satellite cannot see, where you have a lot of clouds. So that's limit really the infrared measurements, and uh, you can see a lot of these common natures, these bands of clouds, you don't really have a single measurement. So one way to get away from this cloud contamination is rather than go to another sensor, one way to do it is to move to a high latitude. In other words, you so-called a geostationary orbit. If you push the satellite to about 36,000 kilometers rather than a few thousand kilometers, now you start to see uh, the same uh, region continuously with time. So you're hoping the cloud will move around and then just by staring at a particular location, you start to sense more of the, the ocean underneath. So this is a composite of the three of the geostationary and uh, Atlantic Ocean, the Indian, the Western Pacific, and also mid of the Pacific Ocean. Now you start to see a lot of these gap being filled, and you can imagine you take many of these geostationary satellites to cover the entire uh, globe. Um, an another technology uh, engineer tried to push is to pick different wavelengths. Now we're moving to the, if you move the, uh, there's a sensor to a microwave range, and now you start to see very little attenuation by clouds. So then you can do a cloud-free uh, temperature. This is the one uh, composite from two of these uh, microwave uh, satellite sensors um, t uh, on the one of them trim, and this is, um, there's a AMSR on the Japanese satellite was stopped working a couple of years ago. Um, so you can tell now you start to see a continuous cloud-free temperature. And that's a wonderful uh, technique to measure temperature, but the only limitation is now you are constrained by the footprint you can measure on the ground. Because the, if you go through the microwave remote sensing, you will see the resolution on the ground is proportional to the height of the satellite, the wavelengths, and divided by the, 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 the size of the antenna. So basically, if you want a higher resolution mes measure mesoscale and some mesoscale, you can imagine this D had to be really large. So it's really become very uh, challenging to fly larger, larger antennas. The typical microwave antenna give you about 25 kilometer footprint on the ground. So it's kind of complementary, have a cloud free, but at a coarser resolution now, uh, complementary to the infrared sensor, you can push kilometer or sub kilometer uh, resolution. So that's the, uh, the SST uh, satellite. If you design the radiometer, uh, again, it's still passive measurements. If you have a radiometer really accurate, you know the SST, and now you start to see the residual signal, and now you start to see what's the modulation of the salinity on this emissivity. So that's a really challenging measurement. When I started, I was told it's impossible to do. And, and that does take at least a 10 years. You can see this is the GPL water swimming pool we built uh, more than 10 years ago. You have this rheniometer and, and then looking at the pool, you can see the salinity changes. And you take this to the aircraft, that's the next step and then mature as remote sensing. And you fly off California, you, you know, I was on the boats and then my first and last research cruise. And to collect water samples to calibrate uh, the remote sensing. And then you start to uh, convince yourself you can scale this measurement from the pool size to the aircraft, 10,000 feet, all the way to, say, eight, uh, thousands of miles and from, from the ground. And luckily, we uh, launched this two years ago. Now so you start to get salinity maps every, every week on a global basis. Uh, again, this is a two and a half meter antenna is already gigantic from satellite perspective. But when you uh, footprint on the ground, 
that give you somewhere between 50 to 150 kilometers. So still pretty coarse, but imagine this is the first SS, uh, salinity map from space, and then hopefully follow on, you have a bigger dish. We are dreaming about 10 meter dish uh, in, the, in space, and that probably give you a mesoscale salinity signature as well. Um, so this is type of model function. If you measure the emissivity, and then you know the temperature, you can basically map what the salinity concentration in the seawater. Um, so there's a couple messages, take a long time to, to, uh, to mature the satellites, and does take a lot of patience and then people's persistence to get this technique mature, and then hopefully will be operational, get better, and more accurate down the road. Um, in parallel to the physical parameters, and uh, there's a series of satellites measure the productivity by different, looking different channels, uh, starting from the CDCS, uh, ocean color sensors, uh, to the su very successful SeaWiff satellites, and then followed by MODIS, now is MPP, uh, various satellites getting ocean color as well. Uh, you can see, not only you see these global maps, and now you can refer to uh, productivity combined with other complementary data sets. You also see a lot of regional features. If you zoom in, you see these coastal processes, and then you see this mesoscale and sub mesoscale variability, the patchiness uh, Craig mentioned early in his presentation. Um, now you start to link the physical parameters, the temperature, salinity uh, we are seeing, and with uh, uh, bio biological processes and then productivity. Um, all of these sensors are so-called passive remote sensing, and then you deploy a receiver, you receive the emissivity uh, from the Earth. And then what I'm going to talk about a few of these parameters here is to look at the at active sensor, try to map not only the passive tracers in the scalar temperature, salinity, and the ocean color. Now you start to uh, uh, use active radars to measure the vector information, not only the surface winds, but also the sea level height and derive the geostrophic velocity, uh, pro provide a dynamical balance between the two, so you can uh, link the thermal hydrological processes and uh, with the productivity through this transport uh, media velocity in between. Uh, quickly go through the scanometry. Um, this is a typical uh, scanometer vector winds. You'll measure from the scanometer. Now you have active sensors. You think about radars. You send a radar pulse to the, to the Earth and you measure the backscatter, uh, the backscatter uh, radar, radar return as a function of different looking angle, and then you can measure uh, the wind speed and direction uh, by uh, correlating with, uh, with a certain wave characteristic and then uh, modulate your reflection back to the radar. Um, so now we start to be more ambitious uh, in order to get a global coverage and also get a synoptic measurements uh, because the, a lot of the marine weather and the storm, they change in on the weekly or less time scales. Now we are spinning the antenna rather than looking, have a static uh, dish. And this is the one meter antenna on the, on the, on the quick scat, for example. That gives you really a wide swath and you can circle the globe in two days and then you still get um, pretty decent uh, um, a local coverage as well. So you have a two days uh, repeat to measure the ocean winds. And uh, satellite altimetry, as I mentioned, Topex I was launched a year before I joined GAPL, and there's a, a series of uh, follow-on um, missions, some um, JSON-1, JSON-2, and now you have the, the, the French, the Indian, the Chinese, and there's multiple constellations of satellite altimetries, and they basically measure the radar uh, time, travel time between the satellite and ocean surface that give you the height of the sea level, and that play a key role to quantify the sea level rise uh, in terms of the climate change. You can see the different color here represent uh, the continuous uh, measurement from different satellites. The lifetime of typical life satellites is three or five years. If you're lucky, you can last 10 years. But in order to build the climate records, you need many of these satellites continuously uh, to measure uh, the same parameter uh, with a similar accuracy uh, of watching with time. A couple of challenges that the previous speaker uh, alluded earlier. Uh, up to now, we are able to measure um, a global scale, basin scale processes, but there's also a lot of the nested, smaller scale processes. Uh, Craig mentioned earlier about this regional, uh, uh, regional uh, web boundary current and eddies, and also you have this embedded in the in the mesoscale processes, you can start to see a lot of these mesos, sub-mesoscale processes with spatial scale from a few kilometers to 10, 20 kilometers. 
and that play a key role on the, um, on the vertical process in the ocean, which is satellite have a hard time to, uh, uh, to infer. Uh, this is the one particular upwelling cases overlay with the color is a concentration of the biological processes, and often you see the maximum is not at the surface, it's a subsurface. So you, you, you take a lot of these sub-mesoscale processes, you can refer the vertical motion. Um, in, in order to cover this uh, space-time uh, diagram, a lot of these processes we are measuring here on the, on the right upper corner here, and then really the future challenge is push this to down to smaller spatial scales and then faster sampling. A lot of the satellite remote sensing repeat every week, every 10 days, um, doesn't really uh, sample the synoptic uh, processes associated with this mesoscale and some mesoscale process as well. So those are the challenges for the future satellites coming up in the next decade or two. Um, one of the exciting, as uh, Andy mentioned, the SWAT mission, a few of us involved, and try have a launch date 2020. As you can tell, all of these take a decade. Um, rather than fly ra one radar, now we can fly two radars and then look at the interferometry between the two. Now, rather than looking the nadir sea level, now you can start to image a swath along the satellite track. And, and the interferometry SAR give you an extremely high uh, spatial resolution. The raw resolution from the SAR measurement from these two radars is on order of between 10 and 70 meters uh, across the track and then five meters along the track. That's actually posed a lot of problem to, uh, to send the data back because we, there's no way we can beam terabytes of data from space to the ground, so have to do a lot of smart averaging, um, onboard averaging, and then to, uh, to a much coarser resolution for, for oceanographic applications. That's where also the, the, the in situ data, the modeling studies will play a role, and then how, how do you average this data down? Is that one kilometer, half a kilometer, or two kilometers? So you have to treat those, and then giving the fact you can only transmit 620 megabits per second. That's really the cap the technology we can do today. And then to use your knowledge, use your model simulations, and to maximize your return. Because once you, once you, you do the onboard averaging, the rest of the data will be gone. You cannot recover those information because you will continue to image other part of the, of the ocean as well. Um, one of the limitations, even with the satellite, with the SWAT satellites, extremely high spatial resolution but it's a trade-off. If you want to image a globe, you have to repeat every 21 days because the swath is only 120 kilometers. So you can quickly do the mass, and then in order to cover the entire globe, you have to start repeat in the same location every 21 days. And as you know, ocean is quite different from today and 21 days later. And the other uh, possible concept uh, the community has been um, developed on this is go one step beyond um, the SWAT, rather than have a two radar on both sides of the spacecraft, now you can play the both, two radars, one in the front, one behind it. So then you can image the similar, uh, same location with two radar with a time difference as the satellite travel forwards. So that difference will give you the velocity um, on the ground as well. So one of the deviation of this concept, you can measure the surface velocity from space and this is the one example of the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico uh, two years, a few years ago, and then overlay with this, uh, one of the Navy high resolution model simulations. You can see this is uh, transport, the velocity, it's a critical here to uh, uh, parameter to, to drive the transport of the tracers here. Um, to really bring the time sampling down, you need many satellites. As you know, one satellite takes 21 days, and turn out there's Already, we are using GPS on the iPhones, and there are 24 of them already have a free signal already being there. So if so for some reason, if you can put a receiver here, and you can easily collect this so-called biostatic scattering, and that scattering properties is not as accurate as your nadir, but it does give you a lot of properties of the, of the wave and the roughness and then the height as well. And actually, one of the satellites just approved uh, recently launched 2016, is to launch six of these constellation receivers to scatter this eight receiver around the globe. It's passive, it's small, low power, and it collect all the reflection signal from 24 
uh, network of GPS satellites that derive the wind speed. Um, so this is an exciting demonstration launched in a few years. And uh, the similar concept has been around almost one and a, when I started, been talk about this GPS altimetry and then still being proposed and then a lot of work for future students and graduate students uh, to push for this is to for uh, this GPS altimetry concept to mature, uh, hopefully become a satellite mission as well. Uh, finally, the concept I want to mention is um, if you go to the LIDAR, the laser, laser ranging, and you can start to penetrate uh, below the surface. There are few people involved in GAPL to develop this concept and to start to, to imaging the mixed layer depth and then to go beyond the surface parameters we have been sensing so far and then to, um, to derive uh, dynamical processes and uh, the budget analysis for the related to carbon. So that's certainly the exciting, probably if not this decade, certainly it's the next decade. Um, finally, I want to, in addition to the satellite, I do want to mention a land-based remote sensing, these high-frequency radars, and it's very powerful along the coast to measure surface velocities and to become a regional uh, asset when you do a regional campaigns. Um, and this, our, our end, my talk here is the satellite remote sensing, we can measure almost every parameter now we dream of is, uh, is, is golden era of satellite oceanography. And also I've been hearing all these exciting uh, robotic technologies under the water and then is take this kind of integration, regional campaigns or maybe basin signal campaigns to put them together to address the important science questions like the carbon cycle. All right, stop there. <laughs>